All right, so now we're ready to prove our sort of main result for this section, which is the, um, the fact that I've alluded to several times now, which is that when you take the uniform limit of, this is another way that mathematicians like to use the word uniform. So the uniform limit of a sequence of continuous functions, which is another way of saying if you have a sequence of continuous functions that converges uniformly, right? to a, a limit, then the limiting function is continuous, right? Uh, so the, the uniform limit of continuous functions is continuous is a way that people like to phrase this. So, um, so this is theorem 24.3. Uh, let Fn be a sequence of functions on some set S in R. Uh, suppose uh, Fn converges to F uniformly on S and each Fn is continuous at some point x naught, then f is also continuous at x naught. Okay, so of course as a consequence, this is, this is phrased in terms of continuity at a point, but as a consequence of this obviously, if, if um, each Fn is continuous on the entirety of the set S, then F is also continuous on the entirety of the set S, right? So, um, okay. Uh, they call this, so in the proof, so for the proof, they call this the epsilon over three argument. So they, they say in the book, they kind of, come at the outset, they come out with this inequality, uh, which is this. So uh, the critical inequality f of x minus f of x naught is less than or equal to, by the triangle inequality, f of x minus fn of x plus fn of x minus fn of x naught plus absolute value of fn of x naught minus f of x naught. Okay, so the idea is that these two we can control uh, by the uniform convergence. And basically you can see why we need uniform convergence. Um, because, oops, I think this is sort of messed up looking. We need uniform convergence because that's the only real, like the only sort of straightforward way that we can make sure we can control both of these at the same time, right? We need to control f of x minus fn of x and f of x naught minus fn of x naught, right? Absolute values, obviously. So the only like sort of reasonable way to make sure we can just guarantee that those are both small at the same time is by assuming that the sequence converges uniformly, right? And then this one we control uh, by continuity of fn at x naught. Right, so <clears throat> here's what we do. Uh, let epsilon be greater than zero, right? Ultimately our goal is there exists, we wanna find delta uh, such that f of x minus f of, of x naught is less than epsilon for x in S with absolute value of x minus x naught less than delta, right? 
that's what we're trying to show. We're trying to show f of x, f is continuous at x naught, right? So what we're going to do is first, right, first, because we don't know, so like ultimately we're going to choose delta to make this be small, right, with fn, right? Like we're going to use f, we're going to use the continuity of fn to choose delta, right? But the thing is, like, we don't know which value of n we're looking at. So we can't choose delta yet until we've actually fixed our attention on some particular fn, right? So to figure out which fn we need to look at, we actually first have to try to, to, to control these outer two terms, right, by picking capital N to be large enough such that, like, there's some little n beyond that so that these are both less than epsilon over 3, right? So first, first choose capital N such that for all N bigger than capital N um, and for all X in S we have um, absolute value of Fn of X minus F of X is less than epsilon over three. This, is, this can be done by uh, uniform convergence of fn. Okay, then choose some n greater than capital N, right? Fig just fix your attention on some little n. I think they just use capital N plus one. So I don't know, whatever, e.g. n is capital N plus one, okay? for this n. Uh, now, because fn is continuous, so since fn is continuous at x naught, there exists a delta such that for all x in s with absolute value of x minus x naught less than delta, we have absolute value of fn of x minus fn of x naught is less than epsilon over three, right? So then for all X in S with <clears throat> absolute value of X minus X naught less than the chosen Delta, we have absolute value of F of X minus F of X naught less than or equal to, like we said, that whole thing. So F, of x minus fn of x plus fn of x minus fn of x naught plus fn of x naught minus f of x naught, which is less than epsilon over 3 plus epsilon over 3 plus epsilon over 3. Oh, mutant 3. Uh, which is what we want, right? And the reason this is true for all x with this satisfying this condition is just because we we were able to choose delta such that this inequality was satisfied for all x uh, satisfying satisfying x minus x not less than delta, right? This middle one is less than epsilon three for all of those values of x, but then the outer two are just automatically true for all values of x and whatever x not might be because of the uniform, the uniformity, right, guarantees that these outer two ones are gonna be true just because of, just by virtue of our choice of capital N basically, right? So um, there's a sort of a picture that might help you understand this argument a little bit. So I'm gonna draw that. Okay, so here in the picture, I basically drew F and I kind of drew, you know, a piece of F between the value x naught, which is what kind of what we're focused on, where we want to prove continuity, and then x is just some, you know, some value, of, you know, away from x naught, you know, obviously, uh, this distance should be less than delta, of course, for whatever delta we end up picking. Um, right, so, uh, but, so basically what you can see is um, that what we're looking at is kind of like the endpoints here, uh, or we're looking at like the differences between F and, and Fn at X naught and X. And then we're also using the fact that Fn itself, because we because it's continuous and because we chose Delta to be small, 
the change in fn can't be too big either, right? So we just kind of make all of these things be less than epsilon over three, and then the total change between f of x naught and f of x is must be less than epsilon, right? Uh, and remember that delta was chosen based on fn, but then fn was chosen just to make sure that fn stayed within epsilon over three of f the whole way, right? And uh, I think it's a good, like it's it's a good habit to think of fn as kind of being an approximation of f and i see and i say uniform approximation just because basically the idea is that you can make by picking n to be large you can make fn be close to f everywhere right in the whole set s so so fn is kind of a uniform approximation and if you pick n to be large enough you can make fn be a sufficiently good uniform approximation of f so that it stays within epsilon over 3 and then that makes this whole argument work so anyway, uh, that's the argument. Um, that's the proof that uniform limits of continuous functions are continuous. And uh, in the next video, we'll just look at, um, we'll, we'll look at, oh, actually, sorry, I'm not done yet. So I want to um, just really quickly, one more thing. So now what you can say actually, so like, so now consider a sequence like, um, uh, fn of x equals x to the n on uh, 0, 1, right? So clearly the pointwise limit of fn is f of x equals 0 for x in 0, 1, and then 1 for x equals 1, right? So f is not uh, continuous. So fn cannot converge uh, uniformly, or not, uh, yeah, converge uniformly, right? Fn cannot converge uniformly on 0, 1, right? Also, I would like to just call your attention to the fact that uniform convergence, much like uniform continuity, is a property we assign not only to a sequence and a limit, but also the set S on which we're talking about the convergence taking place. So in this case, actually, it would be true. So it turns out. fn converges to f uniformly if we restrict our attention to 0 a with 0 less than a less than 1, strictly less than 1 uh, for 0, 1 or 0, 1, um, the convergence is not uniform. So the case of the half open interval, that the convergence is not uniform on the half open interval is like slightly, that's like the, the sort of, in some ways it's the most interesting case because actually if you, could, if you throw out the point one, then the pointwise limit of the sequence on the half open interval 0, 1 is actually just 0, right? The pointwise limit is just 0 on this, on this set. Obviously, on the, on the closed interval, it's not just 0 because there's this value at x equals 1 where f is 1. But on the half open interval, the pointwise limit is just 0, which is continuous, right? Uh, but it turns out that that's not enough to make the convergence actually uniform, OK? So even though the, the pointwise limit becomes continuous when you throw out that one point at x equals one, uh, the convergence is still not uniform. But if you throw out more points, right, if you actually cut off, if you lop off like a whole sort of, you know, part of the interval with non-zero length and just restrict to just a, a shorter interval from zero to some number a less than one, then actually the convergence does become uniform. And of course, you know, the limit is just zero. so it's not too surprising that the limit is continuous, but yeah. Uh, so, you know, there are some kind of interesting subtleties to pay attention to here.
but anyway, yeah, you can also conclude, you can, you can use the, if you know that the limit is not continuous, if you know the point-wise limit of a sequence is not continuous on a set, then uh, you automatically know that the convergence is not uniform. You don't have to go through the whole process of, you know, finding epsilon, proving that for all n, you know, there exists some x and so on, right? You don't have to do all that stuff. If you, uh, if you know the point-wise limit is not continuous. Okay, so that's it for this video. And then in the next video, we'll, I'll just show another sort of slight rephrasing of the condition of uniform convergence. And we'll look at uh, a couple more examples.